pray. Father, we think about the, uh, the thing that Paul said when he was in front of a bunch of people in Athens who knew nothing about you. He spoke these few precious words that God has been waiting and hoping that some of us might reach out and find Him. Lord, we thank You that that's Your heart. Even this morning, Lord, there were some that sang the words and the cry, desperate plea of their heart was, Lord, find me. In the discussion today, they sat at the tables and they said, I, I, I don't know how God finds people. And they listened to the answers, but they said, I need God to do that to me. When Chris raised that we should pray for people that are in bondage to pleasure, self, worshiping self as their God, there are people in the room this morning, some of them Christian, some of them not. I just said, Lord, I need that prayer for me. I don't even know how to pray that for someone else. I need to be set free. Father, we thank You that You're a God who loves people so much you take them where they're at. You take them as they are. You receive them with open arms. But you don't leave them where they're at. You don't leave them where they are. You come into their life. Lord, we pray if we've been hiding from You this morning, if there's anyone in this room that has been trying to play hide and seek from You, Lord, they would just give up. That today you would find them. That your spirit would go through this room and Lord, you would just find them. Right where they're at. Lord, we know that when you looked over Jerusalem, your heart broke and you said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to gather you together. Like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. It wasn't you that's lost. It's not you that's hiding. Lord, it's us that's lost. We are the ones that have hid ourselves from you. Playing hide-and-seek for me, Lord, is like playing hide-and-seek with a preschooler. We can't hide from You. Our hiding spots are so bad, You find us so easily. Holy Spirit, will You just come into our hearts this morning. For everybody that's in this room, Lord, I pray that they wouldn't feel as if they fell through the cracks. We would feel today in a good way exposed. I think of the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years and she was too shy and too embarrassed and too humiliated because of her condition. It was disgusting. And she felt that she couldn't come anywhere near you. But because she so badly wanted a touch from you, she hid herself, broke all social custom, even broke the law of Moses to get to you. She pressed through the crowd in disobedience to all of the common rules that told her that she had to stay ten yards away from other people and shout how unclean she was so that nobody would touch her and be polluted by her. And yet she pressed in. And Jesus just stops while He's talking and says, Who touched me? And that woman's worst fears are realized as everybody started looking around. 
And she was so worried that people would see her. She'd be caught. She'd be exposed. And yet you said something to her. You never said to anyone else in all the pages of Scripture. Your eyes locked on her and you said, Daughter, my little girl, Lord, we pray this morning that you would do that for somebody. That they would be called your son or your daughter. Lord, when they feel like your enemy, they feel like a criminal, they feel that maybe they could come and serve you as a slave, I pray, Lord, that you break through all that and you hug them this morning. You embrace them. You welcome them. You run to them. You find them. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15. I have a couple announcements, but I know God means business this morning, so I don't want to, I don't really want to give you announcements, but they're good announcements. First one. Jimbo, Heather, and Jack have a new addition to their family. They landed a six-pounder this week. Her name is Reagan, unknown middle name, Peyton. Uh, oh, oh, Marie. Okay, no one tells me these things. Okay, it's Marie. So it's Reagan Marie Balaam. You should cheer at that part, too. Yeah. All right. What was the inspiration for Marie? It's Heather's middle name and Cool. All right. So mom and grandmama. What's that? And middle name. All right. And Jack's middle name, from what I understand. Jack is their dog. There's another announcement, and uh, I'm going to ask Rob to stand up. Rob, you did something this week. Why don't you stand up and tell everyone about it? <laughs> All right, they're engaged. All right. That's man stuff right there. All right, way to go, Rob. All right, so Rob and Michelle are going to let us know when they want to get hitched, and uh, we're happy to oblige them. So, okay. Baptism. There's some folks here who need some Duncan in Jesus' name. It's an important deal to get baptized. In the early church, you never see Paul in the Scripture going, hey, everyone, uh, you in the back there, I see your hand. God bless you. You in the back there, I see your hand. You never see that in the book of Acts. And so that's what we do a lot of times. You know, it's kind of like the writer. Someone goes, what do I do? And we got to, like, make them do something, don't we? That doesn't save them. Raising your hand does not make you a Christian when the preacher says that. You know that, right? But we give people something to do. Someone once came to Jesus and said, what do we need to do to inherit eternal life? And he goes, this is the work. You want to do something, just believe. Believe on Him whom God has sent. That's all you need to do. But in the early church, getting baptized was the way that you told everyone, I am now officially a Christian. It was a declaration. It didn't save you. But it was like the equivalent of our, like, raise your hand or come to the front or whatever. It was what you did. And until you were willing to do that, no one considered that you meant business with God. People didn't take you seriously. Yeah, I'm a Christian in my heart. They're like, well, you've been baptized? Right? Like, that's the deal, man. That's what you're proclaiming. You're declaring to everybody, I am now one with Jesus. The old me is dead. There's a new me that's alive and lives not for myself. The old me that lived for self is dead, man. He was united with Christ. 
Christ went to the cross with that guy, paid for his sins, and now I have risen anew. Now I'm a new me that lives for Jesus, doesn't live for self, lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. I am a new creation, and I can't wait to declare that, not only to my friends, to my family, but throughout the entire spiritual realm. That is the shot heard around the world. It echoes through eternity. It is a big deal. If you have not, yeah, woo! If you have not been baptized, please come see us. There's an eight-week class. No, I'm teasing. You know what? All you have to do is believe. That's it. If you want to come and you say, man, I understand all that. I want to start anew and afresh with God. I want this new life in Jesus. I believe. Boom, we're going to baptize you. And we're going to have it here. We're looking at the last week in September. So that would be September 30th. If you have friends and family, you've been dying to get them to church, I'll let you know a little secret. That is the best way to get them to come. There are only two major events that I know of outside of baptism that you can get people to come to your church. Number one, your wedding. Right? No, I'll never go to church. Well, dude, I'm getting married. What's wrong with you? You come to my wedding, right? Yeah, okay. Right? Boom. Funeral, but you're dead. So you don't get to enjoy it. But the third way that Christians often don't cash in on is baptism. That is a huge deal. And if you tell people, look, I'm getting baptized, and I'd really, really, it would mean so much to me if you would come. This is like the one event in my life, other than when I'm dead, I hope you come too, but this is the one event in my life that I'd really like you to come to. Would you share that day with me? Boom. And we're going to try to have food afterwards. I say we're going to try because I haven't talked to anyone about that yet. But we're going to get the baptismal. So it'll be here. There'll be some Duncan. We have a Duncan pool that we're going to put here. And we're going to do some Duncan. Sound good? All right. In addition, there's a group from Northridge that uh, Ruben's been talking to. He's been going up to Northridge and he started this whole home study with non-believers. They've gotten saved. They're going to do some Duncan. And... Uh, so there's other people. And I know there's a host of you that have said, I need to get baptized. I haven't been baptized yet. If I had my way, I'd have like an electric floor here. And every Sunday we'd just go, and I'd be like, come on, who's jumping in? Boom, every week. It's huge. Okay? So uh, anyways, Luke chapter 15. I want you to turn there if you haven't already. And Luke chapter 15. Okay. Verse 11. And Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my inheritance. What's due me? And the father divided the property between them. But not many days later, the younger son had gathered all that he'd inherited and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered or wasted his property, his inheritance, in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but nobody gave him anything. One day, as he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread. But here am I, perishing with hunger. I'm going to get up, go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And as he arose and came to his father, While he was still a long way off, his father saw him from a distance and overwhelmed with compassion, ran, fell at his feet, embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand 
and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to celebrate. His oldest son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house when he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, What's going on? The servant said to him, Your brother's come back. And your father's killed the fatty calf because he received him back from the dead safe and sound. That son was angry. He refused to go in and join the party. His father came out and found him and begged him. But he said to his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And father said, Son, you're always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was right to celebrate and be glad. For your brother was dead and now is alive. He was lost and now he's found. Probably the most well known parable in all of the Bible. What's a parable? Parable literally means to throw something alongside. I mean, there's a lot of things we throw at people alongside them. Sometimes we throw money. That's a nice way to help people. Sometimes we throw a life preserver. So when they're sinking and drowning, they can grab onto it. And Jesus threw out these stories. He just threw them out there and kind of, kind of like you'd throw a seed and see if it takes. Because a parable is unique in that it's like, it's like spiritual truth in capsule form. For some people it hits. For some people it doesn't. You see, a parable is like a window of truth. Basically, you find yourself looking through a window at some story. You're in some fantasy world now. What Jesus, when Jesus told parables, is always about something you could relate to, something true. But some people walked away going, why did he tell a story about some dude and some father? What, what was up with that? And other people found that that window became a mirror. As they realized, he's talking about me. In Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus tells a story, it says, and the Pharisees realized he told this story about them. Now, you remember there were two sons. They didn't relate to the first son. I think most people when they hear this story, they relate to the first son. But it says the Pharisees heard it and they related to the older son. The whole point of the parable is to show what grace is. God's mercy. And a lot of people just don't get it. When you hear this story, you think to yourself, if God were really like that, That would be too good to be true. You see, we've been taught as we go through this world that if something is too good to be true, guess what it probably is? Amen? It's a good thing we're not talking about a God of this world. We're not talking about something that originated here on planet Earth. We're talking about a God who created the worlds. We're talking about a God who the only reason we know about what goodness is, the only reason our hearts yearn for what Jesus is talking about, is because the God who made us yearns for this even more. Even more than you do. It's His heart. It's His desire. They understood that they were the Son as they were listening to Jesus talk that day. And they realized that God was the Father. But the most shocking thing, I think, to anybody is to realize that if what Jesus is saying is true, then God loves me no matter what. The question I want to ask you this morning is, do you believe it? Because somebody's lying. Somebody's lying. Either your heart's been lying to you, 
or Jesus has been lying to you. And there is no middle ground. Either this that's too good to be true is in fact true, or Jesus is a liar. The parable starts off with a horrifying request. Can you imagine going to your father and going, Hey, Dad, um, I know you got some investments, and I seen the boat parked out in the yard, and I know one day, you know, you paid off your mortgage, you're going to sell this house, and you got a house in Texas, and you got a couple more properties around here. Look, Dad, one day all that's going to be mine. I know that. I get that. You've told me that all my life. But how about we settle up accounts now? Right? Just divvy it up to me right now. And the way that the, the, the parable says it is the son comes and he says, give me what's rightfully mine. He's entitled. It's mine. Give it to me now. I don't want to wait. In other words, when Jesus sets up this parable, the first thing he tells us is that when we approach life, we approach it with entitlement. That we basically say, this is my life. Right? We've all seen Oprah. We've all seen Jerry Springer. We've all seen countless talk shows where a person goes, look, it's my life. You don't tell me what to do with my life. It's my life. It's my body. It's blah, 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 blah. There's this entitlement with all of us that this is mine, mine, mine. And Jesus tells a story as if each one of us approaches life saying to God, this life is mine. I don't want a relationship with you. I mean, that's what he's saying. Old man, give me what's mine and get out of my life. That's what we've done with God. Give me this life with all of its gifts, with everything contained within, all the pleasures that it can offer me. Give it to me and God, I don't give a squat about a relationship with you. I wish you were dead, but I can't wait around for that. Can I have an advance? And the amazing thing is that the Father, so much like God, allows him to take his life and live however he wants. And it says that the Son does a very interesting thing. He goes to a far country, out of the watchful eye of the Father. He goes far, far away. You know, years ago, um, they did a, a, a documentary about the phenomenon that happens across the eastern seaboard in the United States. There's a mass migration of people at the springtime. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone know? What is it? What's that? No? Springtime. Spring bake. So much so, the MTV, for years now, I think it's been almost a couple decades now, they actually block out a couple months and call it MTV Spring Break. And everything's revolved around this culture of young people that moves down and turns parts of Florida, and starting with New Orleans and Mardi Gras, turns the, the southeastern United States into a giant orgy. And MTV is like, woohoo! Uh, it, it, it's crazy, isn't it? Because they did a documentary years ago, and they asked people... Why did you come down here? Why did you go to a far country? Why did you? Why not do this at home? Where are you from? Well, I'm from you know D.C. or I'm from this and you know I'm from a little town in Virginia. Why are you here? And he said, "Where I'm from, you couldn't get away with this stuff. I mean, you know, you do this back home, and soon enough it'd be in the papers. Everyone would know who you were. Your parents would be on you. The reason that we're doing this." It's because nobody knows who we are. There's no accountability. We can do and live however we want. And it never gets back to our families. You see, when this guy gets down to this far country, he does things he would have never dreamt of doing under the Father's watch why. You know, in the Bible it says that the first thing that man does when we sin. But you know what sin was? The first sin was man deciding he wanted to be God. He wanted to be the God of his own life. So you'll be given the, the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be able to judge for yourself what's right and wrong. You'll be given the knowledge of good and evil. You will be your own judge, your own boss, the master of your own destiny. No one over you. And man was like, sign me up, man. That sounds hot. I want to be like God. 
And the first thing that happens is when they realize what they've lost. And I think only Adam and Eve really realize what they lost. I think it's hard for us to know when we read that story. Until you become a Christian, and your life gets lit up by the presence of God again, the life of God comes into your soul, and you become spiritually alive. I think prior to that experience, it is so hard to know What's been lost? It's the reason why when I as a gospel preacher tell people about Jesus, I can see, like Paul says, they're blind. They don't know what they're missing. They don't understand what, it, what has actually been lost to them. But the first thing when Adam and Eve realize, the first thing they do when they realize what's been lost is they hide. And they're in the bushes. That's not a very original hiding place. I know they were the first ones to do it. But everybody knows if you're going to hide, the first place you look when you're playing hide is in the bush. Right? Sorry. It's the first thing you do. Have you ever played hide and go seek? Like a two-year-old, three-year-old? Liberty's favorite game. She always goes to the same spot. Always. If I teach her new and difficult hiding spots, I quickly learn not to do that. So I hide in all the really easy spots. Because she's small, she can get in places I can. I'd never think to look if I taught her how to do it. Because naturally, this is how a toddler works. You say, hey, let's play hide and go seek. And they go like this. They just move a couple feet away and they go. <laughs> you know? I'm ready! And they start yelling to you. Daddy, come on! That's how we hide from God. We think that because we can't see Him, that's what this is with a toddler, that He can't see us. And by nature, men are hiders. I have this theory about everybody. We're all walking around. We're, we're all posers. You're a poser. If you don't realize that, you're a poser. It doesn't matter who you are. You're a poser. Because you have learned as you go through life to have this front to hide all the shame, this deception, to mask the insecurity. Hey, dude, what's up? That always cracks me up when I come back to America. Hey, bro, what's up? You know, the, the, the bravado in Americans. British people don't pull off the cool thing too well. I've been there for 12 years. British people don't walk around going, hey, mate, what's up? You know, the British know they're not cool. <laughs> they're just natural about it. Hey, how you doing? You know, yeah, it's a rough day, you know. That's how the British are. And I find it so funny in America that we're not like that. We're just, we're just so fake about everything. It literally, if you lived in another country and came back to America, it hits you like a ton of bricks. What big po- It's so see-through when you get back here. And it's an illustration to me of how much we are all posers because what's going on inside ain't so great. I've learned over the years being a pastor with everybody, as a psych nurse, You name it, wherever I've been in life, I've learned that as you just strip the layers like an onion, everybody is the exact same. Behind all the layers, behind all the disguises, and all the hiding, everybody is an insecure, ashamed, running scared in the face of God, needy, desperate sinner. And the only difference between any of us is the number of layers that we put on to try to cover that fact up. Here's this guy going away to a very far country. (coughs) He's hiding in prostitutes. He's hiding in drunkenness. The, The older son listed off his many sins. He wasted it on parties, drunkenness, prostitutes, you name it. This guy had gotten to rock bottom. I remember when I was a kid watching Pinocchio. Anyone watch Pinocchio when you're a kid? And, and I think it had the wrong effect on me. Because I'm watching Pleasure Island. I'm like, that's where I want to go. Is there a place like that? I mean, I think it was supposed to teach us some kind of lesson. You know, you don't want to do that. Learn from Pinocchio. I'm like, hey man, I don't mind. I'll, I'll go work in a salt mine as a donkey. I don't mind. Just send me to Treasure Island. That's where I want to go. I mean, they're sitting there, you know. You remember that? 
He's smoking cigars. I never had a desire to smoke cigars until Disney told me, hey, that would be really cool for you. I'm like, hey, what am I missing out on? You know, Pinocchio's walking around. He's punching. There's fighting. They're drinking big mugs of beer. Hey, rated G Entertainment from Disney for your toddlers. And then he goes on, right? He's throwing, you know, they're walking through Pleasure Island. He's throwing, like, pies at policemen. Remember that? Do you guys, like, have you watched this for a while? Have you watched it as parents? But that was the place I wanted to be. Because in my nature, that's who we are. Many of you don't realize this, but so many of the old stories are actually the retelling of the Bible story. You see, Pinocchio is the prodigal son. Many of you don't realize in the origin, it was a way of retelling the prodigal son about the Creator who gave Pinocchio life, but didn't want a relationship with him, took his gift, and went off and squandered with prodigal living, ended up on Pleasure Island, and after a while, like this gentleman, realized, I have become no better than an animal. And the Father goes looking for him, desperately wanting, apart from anything that's happened, desperately wanting his boy to come back home. I mean, that's a fun sermon where you just go through all the old stories and you look and see the gospel thread all the way throughout. Pinocchio was an enduring story because the heart knew that it was true. People related to it. What the prodigal son was trying to convey to you is that if you live for your body, the pleasures of your body, in the end it makes you like an animal. That's why in Pinocchio, you know, he's sitting there, the guy with the buck teeth and the red hair and the freckles, they're sitting in the pool hall together. He's like, oh, that's dissy stuff, Pinocchio. And he starts laughing and he goes, hee-haw! And he, you know, kind of gets a little bit worried and then next thing you know, the ear starts growing and then the tail pops out and then the muzzle And he gets scared and he runs away. See, this guy, when everything ran out, he ends up feeding pigs. And as he's feeding the pigs, because he has nothing now, he's wasted everything. That's what the word prodigal means. The word prodigal means wasteful. He's wasted it all. And as he looks down, he sees the pig slop and he realizes that actually looks good to me and it hits him. What in the heck have I become? Sooner or later, that's where it always leads. It leads to a realization that this is not who I started out as. This isn't what I wanted. I'm trapped and I can't get out of this situation. He's bankrupt. He doesn't have any money. He has no place to go. And he finally gets back to into a corner and he says, My father. My father. But we're going to hold that thought. You see, the body, and I just want to tell you this, the mistake that we make in going through life is we begin because we don't see God. We begin to live for what we can see. We live for the impulses and desires that are so loud and so silent. And what begins to happen pretty soon is we live for the desires of the body. But your soul, your soul was made for a relationship with God. That's the core message of the Bible. You are made for a relationship with this God who made you and loved you. But the body is only a vehicle for your soul. And we'll invest everything in the body. There's like a huge fitness craze right now. Got to eat a plate of kale, you know, every day for lunch. And got to work out. I see guys jogging down the street. And I'm not gay, but I'm like, dang, you know. Because they're like, you know. You know, they're like machines, man. And you're just like, you just got to notice that. You gotta, and, and, and I don't like admiring another dude's body. It's not sexual. Don't get my wife's looking worried. But I'm just saying, like, everybody's so fit right now. And I just think to myself, man, that takes hours of dedication. And I think we all should be fit. I have no problem with that. It's good stuff. But for the amount of devotion to just get that perfect body, it's almost like putting the cart before the house, the horse. You can own, by the way, you can only do that and have that kind of body if you don't have relationships. 
Your relationship, when you decide to hone that body, that rock hard, like a perfect 10, your body is your relationship. There's no time for relate. You will spend two to three hours every day working out that body. And the funny thing is, I think you all should work out every day. Don't get me wrong here. <laughs> you all should work out, you bunch of fatsos. <laughs> so if I haven't offended you yet, I just figure I'd go ahead and get it over with. But you weren't made for your body. You can live for your body. But you were made for your soul. Paul tells Timothy, hey, bodily profit, uh, exercise brings some bodily profit. It's good, Timothy. But you need to work out your soul. You might be sitting there today going, my soul? I didn't even realize I had a soul. C.S. Lewis nailed it when he said, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. We get the cart before the horse. When you die, the real you is going to go on and it's going to live eternally. Your goo, your brain, your gray matter, your goo is not you. Right? I've died for 20 minutes on a table. Trust me, it weren't my goo that they brought back. I had an experience on the other side when I was gone. My soul went somewhere. I came back in tears. I came back and worshipped for hours. I came back with the light. I, I was supercharged. I don't know how to tell you. People go and they see a tunnel. I didn't see all that stuff because I knew Jesus. I was straight with Him. I was in His presence. But you're going to live eternally. Your soul is the core part of you. But we don't think about it. We think about where we've invested. And I want you to get this this morning. This whole parable uses monetary terms. In fact, a lot of the gospel uses monetary terms. Terms like accounts and debts. You know, having your debts wiped out. (laughs) Something we all know about. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Right? Investing in the kingdom of God. Investing in your soul. Jesus told a parable where He said, the man would be an absolute fool who invested himself to get returns and gain the whole world back in interest, but lost his only soul. That's how people live. And yet, to put it in perspective, there was a millionaire. <clears throat> he was taking a preacher around, showing him, took him on the heights of his hacienda and had him look off the balcony to the west as the sun was setting and says, everything you see in that direction, it's mine. When I came to this country, I had 50 cents in my hand. That's all I had. But I worked and I sweated and I labored and I invested. Now everything you see in that direction is mine. And then he took him, he said, follow me. Took him to the north balcony and said, when I came to this country, I had 50 cents to my name. And he went through the hole. I worked, I sweated, I invested. Now everything you see in that direction is mine. To to the south, to the north, everything you see in that direction is mine. And the preacher looked at him thoughtfully. He was supposed to give some kind of response. And he said, the question I want to know is, how much do you have invested in that direction? That's the direction that matters forever. It's the only investment you will ever make that will pay out dividends for attorney. Every other one will leave you in the negative. It will leave you with a debt problem before God. See, the Bible says one day we will all appear before God to give account. Have you ever been called on by a tax man to give account? Have you ever been asked by an auditor to give account of every penny spent? The Bible says one day the books of our lives will be open. And that's like a ledger, everybody. That means every time you sin, I don't know if you realize that when it says the books, we're like, well, is that like a photo album? Or is that, no, when it says the books are open, we talk about doing the books. That's bad news. There's bad news in the Bible, not just good news. The bad news is when those books are open, let's see, on this day, you punch someone in the head. Why are you guys laughing? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> On this day, you kick the dog. Thank you. Okay. On this day, all of your sins will be listed out. And there will be debit, 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 debit to your account. I don't know how much 
goodness you got in your account. But I can guarantee you one thing according to the Bible. You have more debits in your account than you have deposits. Like when I was 19 years old and they gave me a credit card. Thank you, Chase Manhattan Bank. I remember getting it in the mail. Mr. Jones, you're the proud new owner of a credit card. And I went, shiching. You know, it was like Excalibur held alive. Ha ha! I with this, I will conquer the world. You know, everywhere I went, ching, ching, ching. I'm 19 years old. It was fun. It was like Pinocchio on Pleasure Island. And suddenly, one day, I got another piece of mail that was not so happy. It was called a bill. And there I saw all my debits. That's what life is like. God gives you this open charge card and says, Live, I'm not going to force you to live. Like a father, I'm not going to force you. I'm not out to control you. But we take it like absolute idiots. And I'm the first idiot. Not insulting you. Maybe I am. But we are idiots. You see, when you read this parable, you realize we are just absolutely insane. As reckless as a 19-year-old with a credit card. And we run out there. And what the gospel is, and what preaching is, is it's somebody out of love for you, saying you have a balance problem. You see, Chase Manhattan Bank Bank was happy. Keep doing it, Mr. Jones. We love this, Mr. Jones. And there is someone pulling for you. He's called the devil. Because his whole business in going to hell, he's damned already. His whole business is to take as many people with him as possible. You're just a pawn. But God is all about saving you. And so what he does is he sends his son because he sees... That you have only in the negative on your account. You don't just have a bill, but there's a penalty. A penalty which you will pay for all eternity if you cannot come up with the goods. And you reach into your pocket before God like we all do. We just think, I can't even bother even trying to follow God. Because you reach into your pocket and you're like, I got some fuzz. I got a button. I don't know where this stuff came from. Do you want this? We know, we know that nothing in our pockets is going to make a difference. We are spiritually bankrupt before God. We can't go back in time and undo all the evils that we've done. We don't have enough righteousness to equal all of the the unrighteousness that we've done. Karma is an absolute myth. It's the attempt to run from the truth that I'm preaching about right now. But make no mistake, all religions have this concept because everybody knows in their heart of hearts, it's a universal truth that everybody knows that you must pay for all wrongs done. I don't care where you're born. Oh, the Christianity born in the West, you're just a product of the teaching of the Judeo-Christian mythos that you've been raised with all these. No. If you're raised in Asia or South America or anywhere else on this planet in Africa, every culture on the planet knows this. It's what's called a core value, a universal truth that all humans share because we have a soul. We are a soul and our soul knows the truth no matter how hard we try to hide from it. You've been handed a bill this morning. You've got a debt problem. And this guy realized he had a debt he couldn't pay back to his father. He doesn't even dream of becoming the son. He realizes he has a balance problem and it hits him as he's drooling into a pig pen, looking down at slop, thinking, how did I become this guy? I thought that pig slop. You ever been around pig slop, anyone? You ever been around pig slop? Yeah? Some of you guys have? I've been around pig slop. It stinks doesn't last long but you have to understand in the Middle East pig slop was gross it sat in the heat it was nasty often it consisted of fecal matter just what you do with you feed it to your pig I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you realize I have been eating feces how are those biscuits and gravy this morning I hope they didn't come up a bit. 
but spiritually speaking, there comes a point and it always gets where we realize, oh my gosh. David said, when I went astray, I was like a brute beast before you. This son realizes I am no better than an animal. Like an animal, I'm just living for the physical. I'm just living for my impulses and desires. If I'm hungry, I just eat whatever's in front of me. I become a spiritual pig. I'm gross. I think everybody, when they first come to Jesus, comes to that point. I'm gross. El grosso. I'm fattened and disgusting. All this stuff I've been eating. I'm going to tell you something this morning. No matter how gross you are, the Bible says, there is a God. All He can see is that He loves you. And He cannot wait to have you home. Cannot wait till you come through those gates In verse 17 it says, and when he came to himself. You ever been in a coma? You ever been in a daze? And you're talking to people about it and you're going, when I came to myself, you know, what what the heck was I doing? It says, and when he came to himself. Ding! It was like a light bulb turned on. Guys, that's what God starts to do. You, You get to the end of yourself and finally the Holy Spirit comes in and shows you. You can go home. That's what he does. I can go home. Jesus had just been telling a parable about if a, if a woman loses a coin, she searches everywhere for it until she finds it. God has been searching for you. And that Holy Spirit beginning to open your eyes, something you wouldn't normally think of yourself because you feel so gross and disgusting when you reach the end of your tether. The Holy Spirit has to tell you, God loves you. It seems like it's impossible. How can you love me? It's like I'm covered in fecal matter and you're telling me that God wants to embrace me and give me a hug? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what he's saying. This guy who feels so disgusting is like, I, 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 and he rehearses his speech. He's walking down the road. He's rehearsing. He's going, I, I'll go back and I'll tell him, I, I, I've sinned against not only you, Father, but heaven. And what I've done is so shameful. It's, it's, it's like even the heavens are blushing and embarrassed at what I've done. But I'll walk down and I'll give him this speech. This is what I'll do. It might work. If I come down and say, Father, you know what? I, 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 I'm not even worthy to, be, to even come into your house. Not, more or less be your son. I can't even enter under your roof. That's how gross I am. But I could be a servant. No one would have to know that it was me. Not bring any scandal to you. Not shame the family anymore. I'll just come. You'll never see me. I'll never claim any special title. I'll just work around. I'll work far away from the house. I'll work way out in the fields from a distance. And yet the Bible says when he's rehearsing this speech, he knows his account's too far blown. He knows he's way too far in the negative. He really has nothing to offer. He's throwing himself completely on the mercy of the Father. It says while he's rehearsing his speech, maybe he's just swinging that gate very sheepishly open and just trying to close it so quietly. The Bible says while he's coming, still yet a great distance from the house, the Father sees him. As he's coming through the fields, maybe the Father recognizes his silhouette or that familiar footfall, but tells us one thing. Tells us that the Father was looking for Him. The Father was perched high up on that hill in that house, looking incessantly for the return of that Son. If you're here this morning, I don't care who you are, Christian, and you're just far away from Him, eating slop, feeling gross, feeling trapped, I've shamed you. Father's been looking for you. It's no different for you. If the older son had understood this just as well as the younger son, it would have made life a whole lot easier and it will make life a whole lot easier for you. If you don't know Jesus this morning, God has been watching you your entire life. Every day has been all about you coming home. 
Every day has been an opportunity for you to return back to Him. What I love about this story is it says that God runs and meets Him. That's what Jesus was. Jesus was God coming to meet you. To meet you halfway, running at you, welcoming you. Every time you see Jesus dealing with someone, He's not like, woman, how dare you disobey the law of God. He doesn't do that stuff, does He? He doesn't thunder at people. That's what the religious people did. All Jesus does is run at people and embrace them and fall on their feet. One of the Gospels says that the Father, who is the head of the family, who has all the power, all the authority, all that, falls down at the Son's feet, weeping and embracing Him. Not around the body, but embracing His legs and His feet. Have you ever seen somebody who is so floored and so in love with someone that when they see them, they fall down at their feet and almost collapse and embrace Him? Jesus is not being accidental about this. He is telling you that the God of the universe who made you, that there is nothing that means more to Him than you coming home. You. I know you don't want to believe this. I know you want to throw up excuses. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I know I'm going a bit long here, but what the hey? It's my turn. <laughs> I want to read to you what Charles Spurgeon said. If you're wondering who he was, he was a Victorian preacher that looks a bit like a frog boy, but we're not going to get into that. He was the master communicator of what we're preaching about this morning. He said, the fact is, the grace that Jesus is talking about is above measure. You cannot quantify it, but you can qualify it. It is higher than our sin. Though that be exceedingly heinous and proudly threatens the gate of heaven, it is higher than our thoughts. Though our imagination sometimes takes a condor's flight, the height of divine mercy it rises to the throne of the eternal. As for the depths of this grace, while the sea has immense depths, the mercy of God is altogether unfathomable. Great sins sink into it and are lost, but grace is just as deep after it has swallowed up a world of sin as it was before. There are inconceivably deep places in God's mercy where even the blackest of sins are lost. Let us come then. Let us come to Him. However much we may have wandered and however defiled God delights in mercy, do not dishonor my Lord by measuring your sin and affirming that it outstrips His mercy. It cannot be. You know nothing of the glorious nature of God. Check this. You ready for this? This floored me when I read it yesterday. By the way, this was attached... Uh, you can see it there. Someone scanned this in with all these highlights, emailed it to me yesterday. And he's a good, good friend of mine. He's come out of a, a homosexual lifestyle um, years ago. Um, he's HIV positive. Um, he's been kept alive by the grace of God for so many years and loves the Lord. But when he sent me this email, I was shocked because he wrote to me, do you actually still believe this? And I know He does. Sometimes we just need to hear it again, don't we? He needs to hear it again, and so do you this morning. Listen to this part, because this is the part that floored me. A child may fill its little cup out of the sea, and it will be all that the child could ever dream of. In fact, it's more than the child can even drink. But the sea never misses that cup. Your sin is like that cup. And you may fill it to the brim with the mercy of God, but the ocean of love will never miss all that you can take from it. Come, take all that you wish, 
and none shall ever question you. Wash all your crimson stains in this pure flood, and it shall remain as pure as the first. I would not speak lightly of your sin, but still do I say it over and over again, that as compared with the infinite mercy of God, it's but a shadow to the sun, or a grain of sand to a full ocean. God is waiting for you this morning to come back to Him. He has enough mercy. A father runs to the son and cuts him off in the middle of his... Re- father, he doesn't even let him get to the end of the speech. You might think that you have to grovel before God this morning. Is that what you think? That God sits there and waits? A couple more minutes. I think you're sorry enough and you've groveled enough. Then we'll talk. God didn't even let him finish. God is telling you, just come. God's love language. The language he understands is just a heart that just comes into the temple and just goes, God, I don't even, I can't even look at you right now. Uh, have mercy on me, God. I'm such a sinner. Jesus says between that guy And the guy who's so religious, he's got it all watertight, airtight. Between that guy and the guy who comes in going, Lord, I thank you because I'm just nailing this thing. Jesus says, God is ears wide open to that one who came in. Who probably more than anyone else thought, God won't even hear me. Some of you guys this morning, you need this lifesaver thrown at you. You need something as you're drowning to be thrown right next to you, so close you can just reach it. You need the grace of God like a life ring this morning to hold on to. Because Satan's been lying to you. Your heart's been lying to you. Like we said earlier, someone's lying. And it ain't Jesus, I'm telling you right now. It ain't Him. He loves you. And he tells stories like this so that you see yourself in them. Have you seen yourself this morning? Has the window through which you're viewing this person's story actually become a mirror? And if so, are you willing right now where you're at to just turn to him? Just come to him. Put all your excuses away. All your reasoning, all your rationale, all the arguments... Because you know what? The kicker is God wants to throw you a party today. He wants to throw you a stinking party. Kill the fatted calf. Take my robes and put it on my son. My robes of righteousness and put them on. Do you know what that means? Remember we were talking about accounts earlier in closing? If all you had was negative, when Jesus walked this earth, All he had was deposits. Deposits of goodness. Deposits of righteousness. Deposits of everything everything done to please God. Boom, the stuff that you have such a hard time doing, Jesus is like, I got this. Jesus once said, I always do what pleases my Father in heaven. Jesus aced living perfectly. You failed. He excelled. He basically comes... And he looks at your account and he says, everything, all his... And how many of you guys in here have debt? Anyone have debt? You just don't see your way out of it? Jesus comes to you like Bill Gates and just goes, that's funny. That's cute. A little account? Put it on my tab. I got more than enough to cover that. You know, in, in, in fact, from now on, open a charge, charge account under my name. There's no problem. I got this from here on out. Um, he turns to you and says, try, try not to ding it so much, okay? But when you do, I've got the goods. First John says, the man who says I have no sin is a liar. And the truth isn't in him. But the man who confesses his sin, God is faithful. 
That means every time without fail, every time, God is faithful and just to purify us from all unrighteousness. Not only is He faithful, He will do it without fail. He's just. That means when you come and you ask God to forgive you, it is a matter of justice. Because Christ has fully paid. God is just in forgiving you. Because Jesus already paid your penalty. It would be unjust for Jesus and then for God to penalize you as well. Come to Him today. All you need to do is to do what this brother did. Receive the gift. See this? This is a very cheeky backpack. Some little girl's going to love this stinking thing. And we're just going to give it to her. She doesn't know right now when she comes to school she's going to get this. Some of you guys didn't know this morning. God is like that. He surprised that son. He wants to surprise you. And that girl's not going to be asked to do squat for it. All she has to do is receive this thing. That's it. And there's something so beautiful about that. How wrong would it be if we demanded her to give something or to do something? No, the desire originated with us. All we've done is said, here, that's God's heart for you this morning. Here's my son. Just receive him. You want something to do? Believe on him who God has sent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your goodness to us. Father, I don't even know what to say. I could keep preaching this. Lord, I could be here all day. There's so many things flooding into my heart right now, and I know that your love is just channeling through this room, Lord. I pray your people, and those who are not yet your people, receive this, Lord. That they get it. That they grab that life ring. That they see themselves, Lord, because they need the help. Oh, Jesus, thank You that You know us so well. You have no illusions about us. You know how hard it is for people to grasp that this could really be true, and yet we see You running after us through Jesus. Father, thank You for pursuing us. Thank You that even now, Lord, there are people that have been running and hiding from You, and You found them this morning. You're rabbiting them out of their favorite hole. You're going to their secret spot, their favorite hiding place. And you're flushing them out. Showing them that there's no place to run from your love. Like David, who was a hider by nature. In Psalm 139, he had lived for over a decade on the run from Saul. Hid himself in caves and valleys and behind bushes. And he says, where can I go, God, to flee from your presence? Even if I go into the very depths of hell, He'll come after me. How wonderful are your thoughts of love towards me. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand on all the seashores of the world. That's Bible talking. Holy Spirit, drive it home. And I pray this morning that those who have been running and hiding would just come and receive Jesus and with it all the forgiveness and all the grace and all the mercy that you have to offer. All Spirit, draw them this morning. Bring them to you. Put a fire in their heart. A joy, Lord, as they wear your robes of righteousness. As the fatted calf that has been slain was the death of your son, you took the best and you slew him so that they could live and feed off of his death the ring of authority that you placed on their finger to be called sons. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God for that is what we are. 1 John 3.1 Lord, I pray that you would throw a party for them this morning.